So just like the little girl in the story, we can't say that we trust God with our finances and not be a generous giver. That's not possible. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. Amen? And we're going to go over that. Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. It says, Lay not up for yourself treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now we're going to pause right there for a moment. It says, do not lay up for yourselves. Do not lay up for yourselves. It's not saying that you give. It says you hoard up your finances and lay them up for yourselves. Amen? It says, do not lay up for yourselves. That means we gather things and gather and gather and gather and gather until what we're gathering goes bad and then we don't can't even use it anymore. Right? It says, where moth and rust destroy. How many times have we had a vehicle and didn't use it and held on to it and held on to it and held on to it? Then years later, it was a bucket of rust. When all in the meantime, you could have gave that to somebody that could have used it. We hoard food up. We save food because maybe for the winter time for power outages. And then how many times when you go through your cabinet, you look at something, you're like, that thing expired four years ago. I was, we were going to use something the other day. I was cooking and I think I was cooking. Anyway, we were looking for something and we... We found something we very rarely use and we pull it out and it's basically either unopened or barely opened one time because you could see it was almost full and it had been expired for two years. So we very rarely obviously use that, right? We buy stuff and then we hold on to it and hold on to it and never use it. We buy clothes because one day we might fit in them and they stay in our closet till we're six sizes bigger than what that was. And then we wind up having to get rid of it anyway, right? We lay up for ourselves treasures on earth. We buy stuff. We hoard stuff and hold on to it until it gets destroyed or is expired. And it says we're thieves breaking and steal. Don't choose to hoard stuff up. You hoard stuff up, it gets destroyed, and then eventually you can't use it anymore. Just give it away to somebody who can. Amen? How many times have maybe we've been there and we heard somebody can use something, you're like, well, I got one, but I really need two. I got one. I got a backup, but I don't have a second backup, so I can't give one away. I'm a planner, so that's... If I'm not 30 minutes early, I'm late. But when you're a planner, you like to have a backup, because, you know, the thing that messes me up is every time I'm about to find something, that, about to use something, I'm like, man, I really could use this tour this piece of thing that I saved that I threw away a week ago and all that does is create more of a hoarder in me right <laughs> right so we have to stop doing that it says we're thieves breaking and steal so who is the thief the enemy John 10 10 says the enemy comes not but to steal kill and destroy but I have come to give life in that more abundant. See, the more stuff we have, the more opportunity we have when we hold on to those things and we hold dearly those things, it's easier for the enemy to come in and say, you know what, I'm going to destroy that thing because that's going to take them off to where they should be. That's going to take their focus off him and put it on that thing. See, when we hoard up things, we have more things to be concerned about. 
And when we have more things to be concerned about, it takes our focus of where it should be. Amen? So when we store up those treasures or those selfish treasures, the enemy will come in and break in and steal and distract you from where your main focus is. It says, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and where neither moth destroy or moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, where your treasure is, where you put your finances and time into, that's where your heart's going to go to. It's a natural thing. If I spend time reading the Word, my heart's going to go towards God. If I spend time working on a vehicle, guess what? My focus is going to be on that vehicle, amen? And it says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If the eye, therefore, is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if the eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, therefore, the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Then it comes down to this right here. No one can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon is the demon god of things. Pride. Riches. Money. Finances. And it Money in itself is not bad at all. I'm not going to tell you that. People say that. People say that because they want you to give it to them. Money's not bad. Money, the only value money has is what we place on it. If you have a, a bill, and it, it's a $1 bill. That bill doesn't have much money to you, much value to you, does it? But if that bill has a one and four zeros behind it, that same paper bill that's made on the same paper, printed with the same type of ink, has totally different value to you. It's not the value of the bill itself, it's the value that we place on it. Amen? It says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they ne neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Amen. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit or one inch to their stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They neither work for it. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek after, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. See, we worry about those things because we're worried about tomorrow. Too many times we look at the past, we look at the future, what's going to happen. We look at the past, what we've done, our issues in the past, instead of focusing on the present. We need to focus on today. You can't change tomorrow without doing something today. Amen? Amen? So don't worry about the consequences tomorrow. 
Because all that's going to do is have you worrying. It's going to get you stressed. And you're going to forget about everything that you really have to do today. All of this comes down to is who is our provider? Who is our provider? Is God our provider? Or are we our provider? Amen? So if we understand that God is our provider, we don't worry about where stuff comes from. Amen? We have to learn to trust God in every area of our life. Not just finances. We have to trust God with our spouse. We have to trust God with our children. Amen? We have to trust God in everything that He can provide for us. Amen? We have to trust God with our physical health. We have to trust God with our emotional health. That's why we worry so much because we're not trusting God to deal with the things that we can't deal with. Amen? We have to learn to give those things over to God. God can never bless you in an area if you have control over it. God can never bless you in an area if you have control over it and if you're not willing to give it away to Him. We have to give everything away to Him and the care with it. See, we don't just give our kids away to God and say, God, they're yours, but then take the care of them. See that? We can't give them away and hold on to the care because we really haven't given them away. Right? We can't give our finances away to God and hold on to the care because we haven't really trusted God with our finances. We can't give the care away about our job and still worry about it. That's holding on to it. When we give something to God, we say, God... I'm going to do my best, and the rest is up to you. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to be concerned. When you get a bill, you say, God, I work, I give. This is your bill now. You take care of it. When your kids have issues, they get a phone call, they're in jail or whatever, say, God, I prayed for them. I raised them in your ways. They're yours now. God has established everything on this earth already. Amen. So, for instance, in finances, in finances, God established tithing or giving to the church as a way of giving to him and to his work, okay? And I'm not going to stay on this too long, but I want to tell you something. I, I do not tithe. I go above and beyond tithing. Because tithing is a minimum standard. Amen? The reason why is because I'm gracious for what God has done in my life. And that's what the New Testament talks about. It, the New Testament doesn't talk about giving 10%. The New, New Testament talks about giving everything to God. Finances, children, cares, everything. So you give everything to God, he can have it all. I'm not worried about it. But he has to provide for my needs. Amen? So even back before tithing was established, it says, Abel gave first fruits, but Cain gave some. In Genesis. When they did offerings, Abel gave first fruits, but Cain gave some. That was years before 
tithing was established. And it says God blessed Abel's gift, but not Cain's. That tells you something right there. You don't give God your leftovers, you give God your best. Amen? And then if you move forward, Abraham gave Melchizedek, the priest, 10% of all he collected. That was before tithing was established. I'm not here to tell you what to give because that's not my job. My job is to tell you what the Bible says. And honestly, I can't tell you what to give because you won't listen to me anyway. Because I could tell you to stop sinning, but if you like the sin, you're going to keep sinning. Is that right? But the fact is, I'm telling you, if you don't give something to God, there's no way you can prosper in that area. You can't hold on to your kids and raise them the way you want to, away from God's ways, and then them go up to be godly men and women unless it's a miracle of the Lord. He said, train your children in the way that they should go, and in the end they will not depart. He told us that for a reason. He said, give your kids to me, and I will take them, and I will bless them, and I will keep them. But if we keep holding on to them, he gives us free will to do it our way. Amen? God blessed, blesses those who give things to him. Amen? In reality, your gift is your approval of God. Whether if you give your kids to God and the cares of your kids, you're putting your faith and trust in God. Your finances, when you give your finances to God, you're putting your trust and faith in him. You're not putting your trust in a church or in a person. You're putting your trust in, in God. When you give to a particular church, you're putting your trust in that church that they're doing what God has called them to do. But it's not just our finances, and it's not just our children, it's our service. It's everything that we are. Everything that we do, we have to put the trust in God and then give Him the care as well. Amen? You're having trouble at work. Give it all to God. Say, God, I'm giving you everything at my work. I'm going to talk to people about Jesus. I'm going to pray for people. You are going to be Lord at my work. And whatever happens after that, that's up to you, God. But I'm going to make you number one at my workplace. But everything that you do, you have to put God first. Amen. Turn with me to Luke 7. Luke 7, verse 36. Luke 7, verse 36. Luke 7, verse 36. It says, then, it's talking about Jesus. It says, then one of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair on her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, 
he's saying this in his head, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, he heard the thoughts that the man was thinking, and he answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with, with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. They wore sandals back then, so it's not like wearing shoes. They wore sandals, so their feet were dirty all the time. So he walks into the house and the, the man who was the Pharisee did not wash his feet. It says, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair on her, of her head. You gave me no kiss to greet him. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, which are all customs. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say themselves, who is this who forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Everybody's a sinner. Every single person. Everybody has so pre-Christ has so much sin in your life, you don't even know that it's sin. So as we're walking around, living this life, this sinful life that everybody's living, everybody's having issues, and I'm not, even if you go by the, the Old Testament, there's about 1,080 commandments that we were supposed to do. Even if you take those out, and you go with the two that Jesus gave us, which is to love God with everything that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said how to do that, which was to, to do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. So even if you just take those, the new ones, not the 1,080, we all fall severely short. Now the issue is there's some people that may be walking around, that maybe think that God didn't have to forgive them very much. Well, I'm not a very bad sinner. I, I sin just a little bit. It's not how much you sin, it's how much you realize you sin. This is pre-Christ. And that's why people don't give their life to Christ because they don't realize that they need a Savior. Because they don't realize how bad their life is. Because it says even the heavens declare the glory of God so you can't look around this earth and not know that God is real. So the fact is that we all need someone to help us. Right? We all get down. We all have issues. But see, when I gave my life to Christ... There was no doubt that I needed Christ. There was no doubt. There was so many issues in my life that I didn't even know I had. But the issues I knew I had were big deals. I was an alcoholic. I had three DWIs. Only one is on my record by the grace of God. And it's not because of lawyers. It's by miraculous things. 
and it wasn't anything I tell people this but it, we say this he says well God pulled me out of all that well honestly to tell you the truth God was trying to pull you out of it the whole time your eyes were just finally open to his grace and his love and the world wants to pull you away from all that. The world wants you to think, you know what? You're not that bad. You don't have that many issues. But everybody has issues. And that's why this man Simon, when Jesus walks into the house, Simon didn't feel like he was a bad guy. He was a Pharisee. He didn't feel like he really needed Jesus. He didn't feel like he really needed a Savior. He was religious. He was a leader in the church. That's okay. He's good to go. But he wasn't. Jesus was most harshest to the religious leaders because they were teaching things and not following them. To whom much is forgiven, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. When we realize how much we've been forgiven, we want to bless God every day because where he brought us out from. See, after Christ, the Bible says you're a new creation. The old one has passed away and the new one has come. So you're no longer what people refer to as a, saves, a, a, a saint that's a sinner. That's not true. The fact is, Jesus, when he dies for you, God looks at you through the veil of the blood of Christ. And he no longer sees you as a corrupted individual, but he sees you as somebody who's set free. Amen? And it's deception of the enemy in this world is the one that's telling you that you're not good enough for God. See, I love Jesus a lot because I've been forgiven a lot. Amen? Amen. There's no doubt in my life that I needed Jesus. And I realized that. I realized that from the time I got saved, I started serving God, and we started serving in the church. The pastor gave me the keys. I wasn't even saved yet. We were teaching, God help them, but we were teaching Sunday school to little kids before we were saved. That's how drastic my life was changed. I was te we were teaching little kids for months before I officially gave my life to Christ in the church. Everybody's been forgiven a lot. It's just a matter of realizing it. And when we're realizing it, when we realize it, the generosity in our life will change. Because we'll start seeing people that have issues and we'll want to help them because we've been there before. We'll stop looking at people that have problems and say they need Jesus. Amen? Amen. See, when we look at people and say, well, he's just a bad guy. That's just a bad girl. They'll always be like that. You're limiting God in their life. Because the truth is, all they do is they need Jesus. Living generous and understanding about that means I owe God everything in my life. I owe Him my children, and sometimes I hold on to them and try to raise my child my way, and it doesn't work my way. And her mom said, Amen. <laughs> You see a difference in your child when you raise them correctly. When you get too busy and you start going off uh, uh, 
the standards of this world, it's a big difference. I don't give God everything because I'm a pastor. I became a pastor because I gave God everything. Amen? So you can't give God everything once you get a title because it's too late then. I would have never became a pastor if I didn't give God everything. The question is, who is your provider? Are you your provider or is God your provider? Who is your banner? Every aspect of God, we have to ask ourselves, is he God in that area? God told the Israelites that I am the banner. I am your banner. That means he's going to lift you up. You don't have to lift yourself up. You don't have to be boastful or prideful. God lifts you up. It says when you humble yourself before him, he lifts you up. Amen? You don't have to trust in yourself to lift yourself up. Let God do it. Who is your peace? Is God your peace? Or do you provide your own peace? Do you use the things of this world to get peace? Or do you look at God? Because the world says, you know what? All you got to do is unplug, get on Facebook for a little, bit, little while. Are you agitated? Grab a few beers. That's what the world says. I used to do that, and a couple led to a lot. When you need, when you need peace in your life, when your life looks all chaotic, just dig deeper into God. His word will tell you exactly what you need to know. And when you establish a relationship with Him, everything, His voice becomes clear, and everything in your life lines up. I can tell you I've been through times where our whole life was falling apart on the outside. And if you looked at us from the outside, you've been like, they must be idiots because they must not know what's going on in their life. We were sitting there not being able to pay bills and our car was breaking down and God provided for all of it. And we didn't even tell anybody. God just gave us money. But that's what he does. Don't tie his hands. Don't tie his hands. Put him first in everything that you do. Everything. Whether it's your kids, your money, your time, your job, anything. Give God everything. And don't do it begrud begrudgingly. Don't hold back. Give God everything. Because He will show Himself true to you. Amen? Too many times we want to be our own source. We want to be our own provider. Amen? God loves you. Amen? And there isn't nothing that he doesn't want to do for you. He wants to show himself true in you. But he can't do it if we don't act first. The Bible says, even in Genesis, there's people that talk about this, Christian and not. What, whatever you sow, you will reap. Amen? Y'all ever heard that? The world calls it karma. But the Bible established it years ago. Whatever you sow, you will reap. Love on people. It doesn't matter what they do to you. Don't let your pride get in the way. When you realize that people are acting out because they need Jesus, even if they're Christian, they need something's going on in their life and they need help, it will change your life. Because when that person gets on to you or cuts you off, you'll realize you need to pray for them instead of going after them. Amen? 
when the person at the grocery store isn't checking out fast enough. Maybe they're dealing with issues at home. Pray for them. You cannot imagine, you cannot even fathom how many times we've talked to checkout people and prayed for them right in line. And then sometimes the people behind us start praying. We're so focused on us. We're so focused on providing for ourselves and getting in and out so fast we forgot to check out and love on the people around us. Be generous with your time. Understand that it's not your time, it's God's time. Don't worry about how fast they're going. Pray for the people around you. That devil's going to speed up that line super fast. Right? <laughs> That's the truth. I'm going to close out, but Craig, when he was in the hospital, you know what changed when he was in the hospital besides me singing to him? I think when I sung to him, he thought, you know what? I better get out because I don't want him to sing to me, sing to me anymore. But he started praying for everybody else in the hospital. And we did that, the devil's like, nah. You looking rough going around praying for people that look better than you. I don't need that no more in this hospital. You're getting out, buddy. You put God first, it changes your life. It changes your life. Amen.